Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to the IDEA seminar series. Uh, today, I'm really happy to welcome Professor Bin Yu from UC Berkeley, who will be giving our IDEA Triad Distinguished Lecture. Uh, so uh, Bin is a Chancellor's Distinguished Professor and the class of 1936 second chair in the Department of Statistics and EECS at Berkeley. She's, in fact, a former chair of statistics at Berkeley. Her research focuses on practice, algorithm, and theory of statistical machine learning and causal inference. And has her group has been engaged in uh, interdisciplinary research with a wide range of uh, practitioners from genomics, neuroscience, precision medicine. So Yu has received a lot of acc accolades throughout her career. She's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She was a Guggenheim Fellow and a Tukey Memorial Lecturer of the Bernoulli Society. Uh, she was also the past president of IMS, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and a whole other list of awards, which I don't think I'll have the time to uh, read through. Uh, she was also the founding co-director at the MSR lab at Peking uh, University and the member of the Scientific Advisory Board at Alan Turing Institute. Uh, so again, I'm really uh, pleased to welcome Ben to, uh, to this distinguished lecture. Thank you. Ben, to, thank over you. to you. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. So what I want to share is some project we have done Thanks, March. So this is really kind of epidemiology project, which is not usually what we do, but let me share what we have done. Thank you for having me. So um, it all started in late March. Um, uh, I responded to a call for data science expertise by a newly founded uh, nonprofit organization. At the time, just to remind you that we were the media was having all these PPE urgency calls. So we jump in. I always believe we shall make an impact and positive impact. And that was a great opportunity to work my talk. And like 12 members of my group jumped in with me. So that was when we started became like amateur epidemiologists. So when we joined um, the uh, Response for Life, it was one week old when we joined, which really helped um, them to distribute the PPEs. And we got on the call and asked where is the data and they said we have no data so you guys have to find the data so this is the team um, we uh, jumped in with me and Nick and um, Xiao were really data team so I have sub teams and we have uh, no Nick and Xiao actually are um, modeling teams and Chandon which at the lower hand corner was my deputy really did a fantastic job with me organizing the team and uh, Tiffany and here with the data team basically scooping data and other people did a lot of other things and Raz was really helpful you know we did paper revisions and all of that so uh, just really is teamwork and then in the summer we continue with new members and then we got a free intern Dantin Wang and supervise uh, Peter Nowak so it's really a huge team and it's the first time even I have about 20 people but I never have worked simultaneously with so many people so that was a challenge for me as well and one point I want to make is that um, it's really we need interdisciplinary team-based science. This wouldn't have been possible without like 12 people on the team for two months and to finish a paper in a month and never happened in my group. It usually take us two or three years to finish a paper. So the doubling of oh, you know, tenfold increase of team members really sped up the process and also put me in a different regime of uh, collaboration with uh, other people and myself. So really, this is really teamwork. And uh, we basically stopped everything for two months and only worked on that. But it's a very interesting project. I felt like it was like a warlike project. We, I have a good friend who is an emergency doctor. And he sent me this article, this guy called Dan Sandberg said, emergency medicine is the most interesting 15 minutes of every other specialty. I felt like. Our projects, the most interesting, a few hours of every skill. Let me just share with you what skills we need. I feel like we're all very technical trained, but right now data science is at the point that we need to acquire other skills to really make the impact we want to be. We, we cannot really remain this um, more like a traditional, we just do the technical part. Just this project is just not enough. So first we have zero data to start with. And we start Googling, email friends, you know, because we didn't use to do epidemiology, so reach out to people. And 
understand what could be driving the death count, quickly we decide that we're going to look at death counts at the county level because we want to go to hospital level because that's where the PPE will be shipped. But we don't have hospital level data. We have basic information data, demographics, but we don't have the death count at hospital level. Still, we don't, except as few. Well, we have UC hospital hospitalization data. And with the news, and everything was just happening very fast. Use my personal connection. And through connections, talk to uh, medical equipped marketing people to see how really the medical supply logics work. And in the beginning, we were after ventilators. And later, actually, I pushed to, um, we support other people who went to PPEs. And we tried to connect with FEMA with not a lot of success. And every A30 is a daily call with their leadership team, all volunteers. And try to get data with hospitalization organizations. Sometimes they reply, sometimes they don't. And we even got um, high schoolers, actually my sense friends, to call hospitals because we said, if we have the PPEs, better the hospital trust us to receive it. And that route was not successful because hospitals just didn't know who you are uh, to trust and receive. And um, I talked to a couple of ER doctors to see like what's going on at, on the ground at UCSF. And I have a team, a sub team of people working with the logistics, people work with the sales to supply and the severity index. And we build a website because we want to uh, have transparency, reproducibility and share the data. So it's clear that we think if we gather all this data, curate them, even we don't do a lot with them, other people find it useful. Instead, we all scrape the same data and source and then have different versions of it. So build a website to share that. And then because we want to share our algorithm and data, we felt we have to document it. That's why we end up writing a paper. So the uh, Xiaoli Meng, who is the editor of Harvard Data Science and Review, reached out to me very early on and said he wanted to interview me and later, we end up writing a paper, send up, submit a paper, and he also did the interview. In the beginning, we're not thinking about writing papers, really for reproducible. And the last is what we used to do, right? How to do the prediction with the data we have. So in all the things, it was not, it was important, but we wouldn't do what we usually do without all the other things I mentioned, like 13 of them. So, um, so it's very, and all these skills, I think, part of it, I think it's what we would like to our next generation data science to have, to be able to work with people you, so that you can have good data, you can have the domain knowledge, you can have the timely expertise so that we get to do the modeling part in a more reproducible, transparent and responsible way. So the first uh, job was to find data. We script, you can see like 30 data sources and thank to Sam from Northeastern who shared some um, data that we couldn't find in the uh, open source um, websites. And we also got, it's all county level, we're the one of the first, if not the first, right? people doing state level predictions or country level predictions. So here's a bird's view of the hospital level country data we um, curated. There's seven, about 7,000 hospitals in the US. Each hospital has about 200 features. Geographic the identified address, what type of facility, urban or rural, how many beds, how many ICU beds, occupancy rate, number of employees, and what's the hospital over rating. Because we really want to be able to predict death counts, in the end, all the data on the right turned out to be not very useful for counting, uh, for our prediction, but we have it there, other people can use it. We have the death counts from New York Times or US effects, and we also scraped um, open source websites, demographic population, population density, age structure, health risk factors, heart disease, so on and so forth, social economic risk factors, and social distancing mobility. Just recently, I think it was Facebook or an, a company reached out to us. They have some new data they want us to have it. I think they recognize a lot of people go to our website for data cube, uh, for this uh, data repository. And we also have some cancer temperature data, but um, and some sample flight and tenors. A lot is like I read newspaper and team member read newspapers, and our data team just script them and do uh, data curation. So this is this talk is not just about the prediction method; it's also about this data repository. I hope some of you will help us advertise and find it useful. 
So the data quality issues about desk count, right? The case number just completely depends on how many people get tested. And this count has problem too. There's undercount problem. After April 14th, counts start including uh, probable death. And suppose the US effects and New York Times data come from the same sources at the county level, but they don't always agree. And we have about 3,000 counties, and we didn't have the human resource to really verify the sort to get a sense of which county is more reliable. And there might be delays for them to put things on their website. So a lot of things could happen. Um, we're using this data repository for my final project for PhD level plus statistics class. We're going to ask each team, at least call one county, to find out the quality. So that's just a really small subset of counties we can get to. If you look at the um, two sources, what you have on the left is each day we have a difference. And we have 80 days, and uh, we have 3,000 counties. So you can see that we have lots and lots of big numbers. And then that's what you see. Mostly they agree. And if you chop the off, you can see the more detail because the scale was too high, the, the vertical. So on the right, it's a zoom in version of the left. And you can see that the difference is um, from 100 to 200, mostly minus 100 to positive 100. And there's something actually, um, there was one correction which was much larger. And the weekdays are also different from weekends. We take that into account a little bit uh, in our, our predictive method. So the dash line is the average of uh, total death count. And you definitely see that somehow there's a peak. It could be just a delay of report at different level from the hospital and how the public health department in a county gather that. I think it's, it's more or less the weekend in effect. That there was, let's look at the first on the left is the number of divisions total is 2100. And then and days for revision is the delay, right? Time lag in revisions. And you use that, we do this. Um, you can do a histogram, but this is the um, a CDF of that distribution of, if you look at the revision and how long people waited to do the revision, you can see um, mostly it's about, mostly you see like 20 days as most. And in terms of how much, how big is the revision, is the sign magnitude. And the, the strips is really because one thing gets revised and future you know, counts also get revised. And there's one down there, minus 1,000. And this is actually, we look into it, it's a King County in Washington state. And the extra dash should be like 530 something, was entered as 1,500. So somebody probably just did a human error under the one, and that created a, a revision later, minus 1,000. That's rare, but um, you do have um, such uh, incidents. And this type of revision, this type of mistakes create a problem for our algorithm. And we have a huge peak or a lift than usually uh, really uh, screwed up our algorithm bit. But unless we have humans there to check all the data, it seems uh, not avoidable. So here's a pipeline we developed. We curated hospital and county data, and then we start develop our models. Actually, we develop many. First, we aim at the seven day because it was enough for PPE shipment for the purpose of responsible life. Actually, they said five days was enough. You, the, the PPEs are made by different um, makers around the country. And then we work with Arab Ridge, which is a lot of pilots who just freely ship the PPE spots. So seven days was enough to, to give them predictions so they can try to um, and ship in seven days. And we imputed the hospital level demand by estimating or predicting the county level deaths and use the number of employees to uh, proportionally distribute the deaths into different hospitals because making the assumption that uh, the size of the hospital in terms of number of is really reflect the demand. This is kind of true. And then we did a lot of scraping, reading newspapers at Daniel Highspot, and we have, um, for a while, Responsible Life had a lot of volunteers, and we also helped them organize that, and ourselves reading this period and to validate forecast. So it's a really a uh, pretty uh, extensive operation, and in a very short period of time. 
So we had the data, and we're now in the stage, I described the data, we're now in the stage at uh, county level predictors. So we develop multiple predictors and use something I worked on uh, when I was about lab 20 years ago to combine the different predictors so that the predictors that work well recently get more weight. So we don't have to switch, we just do soft switching. And the different predictors capture the different kind of regimes of the growth of the accumulative death uh, in the United States. And then we work, use a conformal analysis, use the fast five days uh, prediction error to come up with a prediction interval uh, that worked pretty well. And then we have a website, which is called covidseverity.com, which uh, actually Chandon bought to visualize to today. It's, it's become an automatic AI system to uh, script the data all automatically and do the prediction, visualize, and we update. We have one day delay every day. And all our codes and uh, our algorithms and data are all accessible from that and also linked to appear in the Harvard Data Science Review. So, okay, so this is the second part. I have a data team, right? I described their work. I also have um, a modeling team and there are a lot of other people doing other things. This, we decided the best way to identify hotspot for the hospital level is really go to the lowest level possible where we have data, which is uh, county level and death counts. County, as I mentioned, death counts have problems, but it's more reliable still than the case numbers. So what are we facing? Many curses, very dynamic data, right? Depends on policy change, human behavior change, things just there's no, there's no stationality or anything. It just, it's, it's um, quickly changing. And long-term predictions have to do with feedback because there's no way, that's why all the agent-based model, I haven't seen any model that really panned out quantitatively with the number of deaths or anything we have seen now seven months into the pandemic. And we're also very ambitious, want to predict all oh, 7,000, oh, this is wrong, this should be, 3,000 counties, I mixed up the, the number of hospitals with counties. It should be 3,000 counties in the US because the response for life position itself as a national organization didn't want to favor California or Colorado where the headquarters was. So, uh, and we don't, we cannot really possibly do very detailed analysis. So we have to uh, do pretty global analysis. But blessings is that every day we have a new data point, 3,000 actually, because every county will have a new death count. We can validate and do reality. And we have to be honest. And as I mentioned, for PPE supplies, short-term prediction is adequate. We now can do 14 days kind of okay, but we, we all the prediction on our website is seven days. So we have the data team just designed many different predictors. So in a short period of time, we don't have a lot of subject knowledge. So Exponential uh, growth, right? That's where we were. That's what we did for each county. A linear just seems to be um, obvious. We should do a linear trend, use five days, past five days. And then we did uh, exponential predictor shared coefficient shared across countries to see maybe you can borrow strengths. And then we use the shared cross county and also try to use demographic, right? Remember, I have all the social, economic, and health factors, risk factors we collected. And the other just saying that we share only using the counts and case numbers, not using demographic, it turned out to be the best. So two and five turned out to work best. And how do we combine them? We, we're not doing model selection because we don't believe any one of them work very well. So we went back to something 20 years ago as about lives. So we did uh, audio prediction. So the signal for both music and lyrics, like at the time, internet, Broadcasting was really avant-garde. We tried to do compression to do that, to do predict audio signals. We had both uh, speech, you know, and also music. And they design, they require different type of uh, predictors. I mean, music is very long term, and you know, speech is short term. And Bell Lab had a really good speech record, like a compressor, and people were switching back and forth. So we came up with idea: let's not switch back and forth. Let's just wait use uh, some forgetting factor and see who does better and naturally adapt to whatever the audio signal you have to do with for, for, for compression. So basically we do prediction and then we, we send over the quantized uh, residuals. 
And for a while now, I think Bose doesn't use it anymore. Bose for a while, Bose um, wireless um, earphones use uh, ideas from our um, encoder. And this was actually the, uh, some signal processing IEEE give us the best paper award, um, 206. So I was very delighted that we could use this again because you know, everything happening so fast, you just tap into what you know. So the detail is that you have, say, M uh, predictors. And you just look at look at the big sum, right? You have a forgetting factor mu. So we set at 0.5. I was very worried about um, overfitting, so we didn't have much data. So we just use the C and mu parameter from that audio coding uh, paper. And then you have L. We end up using square root of the count. And you just look at the last few days, and with the tapering too. So we take five days past, but we also have a tapering. So the the five days ago's prediction error doesn't contribute as much as yesterday's prediction error to this weight. So this way, you give more weight to um, predictor recently performed really well. And C is the parameter to control. Suppose you only have two predictors, so we end up using a one linear bank exponential. Then C can also redistribute the weight that you can favor the better one more by tuning C. The bigger the C, you favor the better one more. And we just took the two um, numbers from the audio coding pattern because I was very worried about um, overfitting. So that's what end up the weight, right? You normalize. And then you just let the predictor uh, automatically switch between we end up using five. Well, actually, we use seven days. Sorry, I was not using uh, the predictor. Uh, the fitting was five days, but um, we, in the waiting, we use seven days. So we'll do the next day prediction, and we use the imputed uh, predicted to do the next one. So we basically bootstrap up, iteratively, recursively get a set to seven day prediction. We discovered that actually two and five are quite adequate. We didn't need the other three. Demographics, to our surprise, didn't help because a lot of information got captured. So the first one is very simple, just linear trend for each county. The second one, we use a generalized linear model. We first tried to do regularized version, but it didn't really help. We just basically use a kind of a person um, log linear model. And what you can see that on, on at time t, you use the log death of the last yesterday and the same county cases seven days ago. And use all the neighbor deaths add up log seven days ago, and all the neighbor counties seven days ago cases. So this are the predictors. So we take into account it's a weekly effect and yesterday. And that's our exp expanded shared county exponential predictor. So we have a predictor called combined linear exponential predictor called CLAP. And um, that's why we end up using. And then, now I fix this. So we have a lot more data. The papers are submitted in early May. And came back in June, we didn't tune anything. We just had more data, right? A few months passed. And then I report the result in the final paper. The paper actually got expanded to like the double lines. We didn't uh, write on the data quality issues. And then the referees really wanted us to do that. So the data repository section got expanded, which is good. So people understand um, the data quality issues. So here are some results. So you see. Uh, I'm very much into, if you have seen some of my other work, I'm very much into stability or robustness these days. And actually, I started on this path, uh, as uh, Aditya mentioned, that I was giving the two key lecture in 2012, and uh, was really trying to combine the data perturbation with the model perturbation. So I think there's another level of robustness. It's really kind of hidden in the model, per model uh, robustness is the uh, loss function. That we have three loss functions, the three uh, uh, plots. Why just raw scale, mean uh, average counts difference from the prediction and the uh, predicted. The second one is relative error, because we're looking at cumulative deaths. The higher the goal, of course, the deaths, you know, the number will just get huge, so we we'll look at relative uh, uh, error. And the third one is what kind of square root we used in our weighting. And then we have a square root scale, just to see that whether what we uh, did are robust or stable for different performance metric evaluations. So you can see that the orange is the 
expand the share to use you know seven day and neighboring counties and the past day take a log of that and you know, log linear model and uh, the red is the linear and the blue is the combined we call collab so in all three metrics we have consistent uh, overperformance of like um, the um, our collab uh, relative to two uh, like basic predictors and of course because we use weighting in the square root uh, uh, transformation, the first one looks like the orange looks hard because the scale is different. We didn't take care of that, the right scale because scale, so that's why it looks orange is a lot worse. But most of the time, almost all the time, that you can see that our blue collab is definitely one of the better three, right? There is, if you look at the, the first panel, that in, in the, there was a period the red in term, the linear uh, uh, predictor our performs our collab in like um, early April. And, but if you look at using the square root uh, um, metric, then it's not the case. It just, uh, we, we, um, we didn't want to tailor our prediction too much into the, the cons because that can really, the outlier can really dominate. So we did the square root. And, um, but that's just unfortunate. That's where linear actually works pretty well. Uh, in that regime in April, we're kind of in a linear regime. And this is, unfortunately we use the same colors. We could have used different colors. Now this is the same matrix, but a different horizons. So the red is the seven day. That's what's good enough for responsible life. And orange is seven days and blue is 14 days. So of course, um, it gets harder and harder. And if you look at the first one again, because the metric was not tailored to all this raw scale, uh, mean scale, mean average absolute error, then uh, in the beginning, just very volatile. So there were cases that um, there was a weird, like the 10 days seems to be harder than the 14 days, but that is a weird uh, volatility of the data. And you can see the other metrics, you don't see that weird phenomenon. And this is just if you want to push further into the horizon to 23 days, you can see that on average, you have a linear scaling for all different three metrics and you have the box plots on top of it. There's some outliers, definitely. Um, the scale, you can see the raw scale, which is much, much higher because we didn't really use that as the, uh, in the algorithm design to use that to, to do the weights. So it doesn't do very well, as well but still kind of reasonable. So that was reassuring uh, that all these reasonable metrics would perform as expected. This is the same um, information, but uh, in, in table, which is harder to see. You can see that we also did a three day ahead, five day ahead and collab kind of consistently. One we're not as, as competitive, but um, this is median in the middle. You can see that. When we're worse than the linear, we're almost as close, right? It's 5.39, we have 5.38. And the percentiles, mostly, um, you can see linear, but some percentile actually works. The quiet places works well. But if you look at the median for the majority, then um, clap is really the winner. Oh, sorry, I had two of the same slides. So now we are at, we have a good predictor clap and we want to go for interval prediction, right? Because you want to give people some sense when you do planning, not just it's going to be 100 deaths, but you want to know ballpark. It's going to be up to 200 or only going to be up to more like 110. So uh, this is not a generative model. I don't know whether we can probabilistic generator in this very dynamic situation. We just don't have a lot of money. So we have to borrow strands across different days and cross different days. The simple idea we had was just lo look at the five uh, days residuals in the past, the Santa Clara, this is all data. Um, and then just look at relative error because the absolute errors, even square root of that, it's just not comparable because we're looking at cumulated data, just keep going up. So relative, most, more like you are comparable across a few days. And then we'll take the maximum of that. And now we just add that to our prediction. That's our 
prediction interval. It's kind of following this conformal analysis, a very nice theory by Schaeffer and Volk. Volk uh, is, uh, I think, the last student of Kermogorov. And really, I kind of, my work across his while I was working on information theory, and he was really pushing this line of about uh, algorithmic probability theory that uh, Kermogorov won to in late 60s that really tried to rebuild um, probability theory foundation on top of Turing machine. So this is a very nice uh, way of kind of more individual, almost go back to our original gambling interpretation of probability without the sample space and probability uh, theory to just frequencies. So this is frequencies we look at each county across different days and see how many times we get covered and has a lot of uh, good following already in like a weather forecasting. And conformal analysis, people have been also trying to make it back to IAD, but I think it's more natural in the time series and situation. So that's what we did, right? So you have the last five days, take the maximum, the error, absolute, and add on top of our prediction. Of course, this is cumulative. If the interval goes beyond, goes below the, la the last observed data, you don't want to use it, chop it off and make it uh, a narrow interval. You can make some assumptions which more or less follow that if all the past five days uh, residuals and the future predictor are exchangeable, that's kind of the idea, the mathematical kind of concept under a conformal analysis, then you can show that all the ranks, when you permute them, there's only five over six chance that um, you, you will get covered. So um, you will be, you will be, uh, the max will be, you'll be going beyond the, 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 the this max interval. So you get 83% coverage if exchangeability holds. This is the average rank, should be 3.5, there's quite a bit of rubber down average, but the really proves is not this assumption, it's good to think about assumption, it's really validation, is look at the coverage. So this gives you some sense of what's the target, but you can see that from, we just look at different intervals, April 11th, the first month, uh, after you, know, you need some data to train, then we, we really above 80% most of the time. But the, the, the average size are pretty big, but uh, the second still, but we really aim at uh, counties which deaths larger than 10. If you do that, the intervals are reasonable because when you have very few deaths, I'll show you one, it's just wild, even just display the data. So the coverage, usually when the low coverage like 40% is because there's a sudden uptick, like there's a, a revision and we just go through um, off the track because the error, we don't know. We, we don't know how to correct for that. Later we will recover. But at the time, because remember, you remember that my plot, the delay could be 10 days or something for the revision. So it's better to have human in the loop, somebody checking to have better data quality. So a lot of uh, our low coverage is because it's an up peak. And now Argon couldn't really keep up with that. And then you have an interval. That, but I'll show you some results. I'll show that. Even when we miss the, uh, the, the prediction or the observed, we don't miss a lot. So we have done the interval. Now let me tell you about the visualization. So what we have, the covidseverity.com, Kenan was really smart. He just bought it and started doing this, uh, um, you know, design this website and really get a lot of attention. And also people find it very useful than reading the paper, which is a lot harder. So every day we script uh, from USC Facts. Oh, the reason we use USC Facts, not New York Times, is because USC Facts, when we went into this um, prediction uh, exercise, New York was really the hotspot. And USC Facts has the different districts of New York as different counties. And New York Times has whole New York City as one. So we didn't like that. That's the main reason we went for USC Facts. And then we do have some automatic, all the static um, uh, features already uh, curated by humans. And we have pretty good documentation on that, how we did all the judgment costs. But the, the new data coming in, we do some basic um, cleaning and then so automated. We run this on, we have a lot of credit due to an NSF uh, project with AWS. So we run it on AWS, uh, everything, prediction intervals, plots and maps, all automatically generated. As I said, right, you know, that's the number I 
I showed you about King County. It would be good to have human in the loop. That's my um, vision of how uh, AI is actually human machine collaboration. We can have the humans do the frontier work and then understand things. When things become repetitive, we bring in um, machines. At the same time, humans should always have oversight, never let things completely automatically run. So this is now has changed actually our, our front end. So our front end of website now on the head, on the left is a map of accumulative cases. This is I updated like on Tuesday, so it's pretty recent. And you can say that, well, that depends on the population. You're exactly right. And we have the slides and other things data now. On the right hand is something new. We actually have been wanting to go causal to do clusters, but we haven't really gotten there, but we did have some this, um, capability for other people. You can put in a county and use one of our metrics and say, let's look at all the other counties with a similar trend or something. So that's what we did um, on the left. It's like comparing different counties. And then down there, there's also two plots. This is cases and deaths. So the paper only um, uh, discuss deaths. The same method actually worked for cases, but we didn't put in the paper. It's at the website. And you can see the different counties. And we also do the matching of the first case happened. So you have a time lag, recognizing different counties don't have the same starting point. And if you click on the left, view interactive dashboard, the blue dashboard, then you get to this page. And we have eight metrics on top. You can click, we have cumulative case, cumulative deaths, new cases, new deaths, and normalized by 100,000 uh, density. And this is um, Tuesday, new cases per 100K. So you can see that the, um, it seemed to be what's happening is really upper, like North Midwest. And the top is a place called Carter, Montana. And the, the red is a search. You can put in Montana, Carter County, and take a look. It looks like per 100K, you have 12,000. That's huge. But there's a problem. So that's why we have the next thing. If you look at that, Carter County only have 1,000 people or so. So they only have like one death. Because of normalization, they become so up there, so red. But this is not reliable. It's just because there's one case, there's very sparse. It doesn't, you cannot really talk about um, deaths per 100K. Right? So that's a problem. But our facility, I mean, this search uh, capability allow you to check the top one to see whether it's the case or not. So this is, I, I was like, this is what's going on. I realized this is just got blow up because the normalization is a very, very uh, small county. So this is just, you look at the county level data, you know that it's one or two counts that um, it's not very reliable. And you look at the second one, the Cairo County in um, Mississippi. And this, you can see that at least they have 12 deaths. It's a lot more reliable, tenfold than the other one. So this is kind of okay. And, uh, And then you can see our coverage. But that's actually doing pretty well because it hasn't been changed. And then for cases, we 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 kind of underestimate when there's an up peak. So I don't know whether the up peak for the blue, which is accumulated case, then maybe it's a correction, which later we'll find. So that's why we miss it. It's when this sudden up peak. We we cannot keep up because um, there's nothing in the past to tell you there will be an up peak. A trend is okay, but sudden jump. The ability to assume the future is similar to today. And I know uh, you guys mostly in Atlanta, so look at that. It's Fulton County, and um, you can see that uh, you guys, um, we the death count again, we have pretty good coverage for case prediction. We are not as good, 0.7, but still not too bad. And somehow we seem to have over in the beginning of uh, September, we over predicted. But you can see it's pretty close. It's not a huge difference. But to be to be honest, we didn't tune our method for case numbers. We tuned everything for the death. We can actually just add a factor to have the right coverage of a case. Because really the maximum of the, the relative error 
it's really give you the magnitude, the right scale, and then you can tune by a fixed factor and use the empirical coverage to find the desirable coverage. And what we really give to response life was not this it counts. We reach attribute, we uh, impute the hospitalized death counts uh, using the employee numbers because we have that. And then we do very rough. We use the total deaths and new deaths and cut into three categories, high severity, median severity, and low severity. And then it was never fed into an optimization routine to optimize because uh, we had limited uh, PPEs to distribute. So it's very heuristic at this level for them to look at to see, oh, this is a severely impacted area. So it's humans looking at these indices and then and combined with donor requests to do the distribution. So we work closely with Don Landworth, who really was hands-on designing the logistic system. And this is some photos from you work with Arab Ridge on May 8th to ship uh, face shields to uh, Temple University Hospital. Now the response life kind of completed mission is not really in uh, operation very much anymore. So the impact is that um, response life built this uh, Salesforce um, logistic system. It's just a pity that you know FEMA, we couldn't find our in for FEMA to use it for any of the public health department to use it. Everything's so busy. They will did make many shipments and work with different organizations to, to do uh, the PPE shipping uh, early on. And if you go to, I already showed you the size, if you go to the, the right of the uh, click dashboard, that's what you see on the right hand side. So what I saw is a new deaths from uh, Tuesday. You can see where the new deaths are per 100,000. And I think some of the upper Montana ones probably like inflated because they are a small county. It looks horrible, but actually there's one case just because they have very few people there. So uh, take this with a grain of salt. And um, on the right is um, the classroom that you can choose different. So here I have chosen you have to give a photon that's Atlanta, where it is, and then you ask, how do I cluster? So I use total deaths to uh, cumulative deaths to cluster. So those are the places similar to Atlanta, like you see in Fairfax, uh, uh, Virginia, the Page, Illinois, Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and so on and so forth, and New Jersey, two places in New Jersey. So this is here, what are the counties similar to me? And the last two I didn't show you is like a shift the curve to match the first day. This is just natural time and cluster that way. And we also did, did a shift uh, clustering. So this is just for people to explore into some uh, similarities. So the paper, as I said, um, is finally, I think, uh, uh, accepted by uh, Harvard Data Science Review. And we had another person actually join us in the summer. And where we are. So I want to make a comment that both this uh, combination algorithm, you can have your own predictors. I can combine with um, agent-based predictions in this combination. And with machine learning and signal processing is basically what I'm doing, that put it together and just see who perform well. And then we use that in terms of. And uh, the MAPI interval is agnostic to predictors too. It's just you need some kind of exchangeability but even you don't, you can just empirically validate it. Yeah, every day you have a coverage and you see on average you have the right coverage. And uh, we're working on a paper in the summer. Actually, we, we finished this paper, but we also want to help uh, California to do hospitalization prediction. And um, we end up using county data again. We have five UC hospital data but we couldn't get access even, we talked to the states, they're supposed to share data with the UC researchers, it hasn't happened. And uh, so we have the county level hospitalization. And for that, we actually would change the, uh, the predictors. We actually use a moving average works better with hospitalization. And uh, we also have some smoothing, so it's, we, we don't use the exponential and the uh, linear um, anymore, we use moving average and something else. And we use the same combination and the same IP, but we do have to do the scale uh, 1.4 a bit. And we also start tuning the C and mu. There was a Purdue group that start using our method to compare with the Hawks approach 
and they have very um, strange metric. So for the metric, seven day prediction is easier than three day and five day, which is the metric was really strange. But I like the fact that they actually tuned our CMU, which they also had more data. So we start tuning, tuning CMU for this paper. We get more power out, but we also have more data. And the data repository is still there. We just added some new data. Uh, somebody else actually reached out to us, want us to add their data. And over two week period, this is a while back, we have like 12,000 visits and uh, 53 unique cloners, which means they downloaded everything. Hopefully they're making good use of it. And uh, both CLAP and MAPI are simple and fast and very transparent. You know exactly what you're doing and you can combine different uh, predicts based on different mechanisms. And watching the weight give you some sense about which regime you are in. You're in the leading regime of growth or you're in the exponential regime, but not always very clear. Well, this is an old slide. I should say we kind of still have continuous slow response of life, but I don't think response for life is as active as before. And we have our results um, on and blog at the Center for Spatial Data Science Atlas at University of Chicago. So we work with them. And our predictions already at the CDC Forecast Hub. I've been hoping that they will use the weighting, but somehow they have different groups adding. Sometimes contribute predictions, sometimes not. That I find it strange. I thought they should just require them to always give continuous uh, predictions and also have open source uh, reproducible codes. And also many the prediction you cannot find where is their source code. And we are working on the hospitalization prediction and doing that depth to tuning inspired the uh, Purdue paper, Chang et al. We're kind of always thinking whether we should do causal investigation. And we already in the summer, Dan Qing already clean, use um, uh, natural language processing. We have some um, data on policy changes at county level, but we, we haven't found the human resource to do that. But the clustering, which we put on the website, are really one step towards some. I wouldn't dare to call causal inference, but I would say causal investigation. But things have been slow since teaching started. So um, that's where we are. We have the data and code at um, our website and we have visualization and the paper. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben, uh, for the uh, nice talk. Any questions uh, from the audience? So, uh, Ben, I, I had a question. Uh, uh, so, in, in our work uh, for, for this kind of a problem, we have, uh, we have seen that a lot of these experts also demand explanations for these predictions. So, uh, like, like, why exactly are you predicting what you're predicting, and so on? So, have you have you seen that in your own experience as well? And if if uh, if if you had to give explanations to say the response for life, now what kind of explanations are useful for that? Well, I think for response for life, I think they're pretty trusting us, so we didn't have a lot of pushback on them. They're all volunteers, but in the referee process, people did say that you know they that's count has problems and, uh, and has quality problem, and we agree. But I usually take this, this was like a wartime project. You do the best you can. This is not an academic project. This is just, you do the best you can to help the organization to teach you PPE. So it's the best um, effort approach. And we're helpful. So, so do, you, so do yeah. you identify any signals which are very useful for your prediction, like or? So is there any particular feature you felt data signal which you felt was very well, useful? In the end, we just used the, the yesterday was the most useful, and then also the neighboring counties are the most useful and mm. seven days. Yeah, so that's what I identified. All the demographics didn't really help, but it's embedded in the in this um, you know past neighbor stuff, right? There's the neighbor says that there's transmission, right? There's people mingling, so that's why we find neighbor predict uh, being helpful. Right. And there's a time uh, like um, a weekly uh, periodicity that we took into account. But mm -hmm. um, just since we're in the prediction game, we if the prediction doesn't help, we don't feel like we need to include those demographics. Yeah, okay. simpler. So what we learned is yesterday is really helpful and your name was happening in your neighbor kind. It's not just a death, it's those cases, especially cases seven days ago, it's like it's even it's not as reliable with all the number of testing is done, but still predictive of how many deaths might come. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay.
So we have another question from Rakshit Srinivasa who asks, uh, did you consider using any graph structure to improve predictions? For example, uh, bigger cities, although not in neighboring counties, can have similar trends. Definitely, that's something people have asked. We didn't go there just because of time pressure. We need to get something running. And uh, I think if we are interested, that's why if we didn't set our goal on the national one, we might have gone if it's in San Francisco or California, Rob can do more detailed modeling. But the national mm -hmm. scale, we didn't have the understanding of all metropolitan areas in time to do this. You can, people ask, one of the referees says, why did you do uh, like a uh, hierarchical? Right, that definitely makes sense. Our clustering try to go there, more data-driven way. But each metropolitan, you have to understand, get a structure that fit to that metropolitan area. And since we're doing it at the national level, it makes a lot of sense. And our data hope can solve if somebody else wants to do that. I think we should really do continuum modeling uh, 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 for, to prepare for the next pandemic. Right, so hope this data will be useful for that. But for myself, it's just teaching started. I was on sabbatical. That's why I could do this in March because I didn't, but when teaching started and my students also have to continue with their, everybody dropped everything, right? I cannot really say that this is, if it's a short term thing, we might have done it, but this is a long haul. And, yep. and so um, with the right data, I might jump back in, but right now I feel like I always want to have a very clearly defined goal and responsible life kind of mission accomplished, right? We just went in, everybody was volunteer jumped in to help. And if I, if the state department in California start more open working with us, I might have stayed. But in the absence of that, I don't, I'm not that motivated to stay in. Just mm -hmm. because I don't know, I don't want to write another paper. Even this paper was nice, you know, to, to share what we did. But this is not a paper writing game for me. I usually don't run the paper writing game anyways, but right. So I, I, I need a clear goal to jump back in. Oh, the epidemiology community is really waiting to work. Something mm -hmm. to see how I have an impact. Then doing just more of this modeling, write another paper and who knows who's going to use it. It's, it's not very appealing to me. Right. Yeah, I always want and, to have uh, see the impact. Yeah, right, right. No, uh, and uh, so another question I had was like, uh, did you consider using any of like uh, the intervention information, like these shutdowns and all these other we mandates tried, at different county levels? We tried a little bit, and we didn't have all the information. We have some data on the early, a little bit it didn't help. A lot of things all embedded in the time series. And more directly for our prediction game, then then uh, that's why I said the causal angle would be nice. But I think there's so many confounding factors, and there's also a compliance issue. When you have this, I was going to use a uh, hot blue or red a county is as a compliance factor uh, measure or something, right? Because you can't have a policy and people don't follow it. It's not it's, it's not what's right. being it's not a real real intervention. Right. So unless you have some understanding of the ground uh, implementation, this policy is not that useful. Knowing there's a policy is not that useful if people don't comply. And the culture, right? When people in Italy tell me that now everybody reopened and they uh, kids back on bus, right? And then Italians always kissing each other, having parties in summer and pop, pop right? So. Without the human behavior level, the policy is very limiting in terms of knowing what's the real intervention. Right. So uh, next question is from Mark Borodrowski and uh, who asks, uh, parameters of the pred predictors could change in time and in space. Yeah. Did you find any large scale change in the patterns that were related to the time of the year or differences in policies? We look at a bit of the ways between the 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 switching from linear to that. I just don't believe we didn't, but I also don't believe we're going to see anything. I think we need to see, uh, we need to understand the compliance issue before we see the policy. Yeah, okay. I think it needs a, a lot more so, like careful analysis, which we don't have the human resource to do right now. Okay. Too many confounding uh, guys. Yeah. Sorry, no, uh, go ahead, sorry. 
But I'm um, just uh, common sense. I believe mass work and distancing work. For me, uh, you know, like to really use model to support that, for me, it's overkill. <laughs> just a medical knowledge, right? For me, it's like, you know, if it's common sense and just knowing basic uh, medical transmission of disease and all of that, right? right. <laughs> and for me, at least personally, I don't need a model to show it's a causal inference because it, for me, it's unnecessary. And I doubt that a lot of other people who are less sophisticated as me with causal inference will find that convincing anyways. So I don't find it very uh, useful to convince people to prove, right? Sometimes common sense is good enough. So uh, we had another question from Alexander Rodriguez, who asks, uh, I saw there is a plot of similarity between counties, uh, but I missed how this similarity is being defined or calculated. Could you go over it again briefly? So for our website, what you do is that you, we have only given you a few choices. So if you use total desk count, you basically have curve for different county, and we just cluster maybe nearest neighbor, and you have to specify like five, we do five. So we just find the five nearest neighbors to make the curves match. And then mm -hmm. the top two is case and death. And then next two is I will shift the time a little bit to match them so that the first match the date that the first um, the first case or first death reported. So it's very, very um, simplistic. Okay. It was kind of our beginning, try to get a little bit of causal investigation, but mm -hmm. summer ended. And I was not very convinced myself that there's any signal there, <laughs> and I got busy. So, and since we're amateur, it's very easy to say we're done with our amateur job. We go back to what we used to do. So that's what happened. But I'm open to when we have a good collaborator, when I can see the impact, I'm happy to jump back in. But the State Department, the public health, in, we tried. We tried very hard. They're too busy um, to to. Yeah, they, we said, how about just using our, our uh, prediction intervals, right? It's a very simple idea, right? They use SAS, and I said, we can't really help you to connect with the Python code, but they're too busy. So it's, I think we saw an old uh, like working relationship. It's very hard. I can see from their point of view. They don't know us, right? You know, they probably, a lot of people contact them. But they did reach out to UC researchers data. We want to share data, but I think the privacy issue got them. So we still haven't seen the data. They're supposed to share data with uh, many of us, like in old California, right? who got sick, who got tested, and where they got to the hospital, and when they checked out, right? Those type of data, which is still relevant because this is not ending. But this has been two or three months. We haven't seen data. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I think uh, that covered all the questions, uh, and we are also at the three o'clock mark. Yeah, thanks again uh, for, uh, to Ben for giving that great talk. I, I'm sure. Thank you. you thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, and see you next week uh, uh, for another edition of the seminar series. Bye bye. Bye.